Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 20th. Today's topic is Amazing Digital Projects for All Students with Google Tools with our featured teacher for August, Matt Bergman. He's our special guest. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Um, Matt, please keep your mic off until you're talking. Thank you. There's, there's a feedback. And the interesting thing is only the person, everybody else hears it except the person making the feedback. Um, I'm actually going to turn the mic over to Maureen, who will introduce Matt for us. Great. Thanks, Lori. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm really excited about today's topics. I first noticed Matt's work when I moved from being an independent school teacher to public schools and was serving a much more diverse population. I was looking for ideas to serve all students and found Matt's website, Learn, Lead, and Grow, with UDL right in the website title. His knowledge of tech integration and of universal design for learning principles and practices continue to be a fantastic research in my own work with teachers and students. Matt is a former teacher and currently serves as the K-12 Technology Integration Specialist at the Milton Hershey School in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He's responsible for helping teachers integrate technology into their classrooms while providing ongoing professional development throughout the school year. Matt has served as a graduate instructor and online course designer in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New Jersey. He is a member of CAS Professional Learning Cadre who works with educators across the country to implement the Universal Design for Learning, UDL, framework. If you haven't looked into CAS, check it out. It's wonderful. Matt is passionate about sharing his knowledge of technology integration and designing accessible learning environments that work for all students. He's made presentations at Harvard University, at ISTE, at Towson University, and Clarion University. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Matt to Classroom 2.0 Live. And Matt, what, I'm going to be giving you the newbie question. Let me just flip this over one. The newbie question for today for Matt is, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Take it away, Matt. Hey, thank you so much, Maureen, for um, that nice introduction. And so to answer your, your question, what does Web 2.0 mean to me, I think it, for me it represents a whole new generation of tools that enhance collaboration, enhance communication, critical thinking, and creativity. Um, I, I love Classroom 2.0 tools um, that are device agnostic, meaning you can use them across an iPad, Chromebook, or MacBook, or PC. Uh, and so that's what that means to me. All right, so I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, get started with my presentation here. And uh, it's titled, Amazing Digital Projects for All Students with Google Tools. And when I started thinking about 2.0 tools and um, some of the things that you can do with them, uh, I, I really, really was inspired by just the power of image. Uh, as Maureen had said earlier, I've made a couple presentations um, all over the place, all over the country, but I absolutely love uh, webinar presentations because of just the diverse group of people that you can reach. So I'm really honored to, to be here today with you. And um, I, I think of the quote, a picture speaks a thousand words. I mean, we hear that all the time in our country and uh, throughout our world, and we hear that in education, but do we actually take that quote to heart when we're working with students? Now, as Maureen had mentioned earlier, I'm a big, big supporter and a member of the UDL uh, cast, uh, cadre of uh, instructors that go across the country teaching the Universal Design for Learning framework. And if you don't know a whole lot about UDL, it's all about reaching students in ways that work best for them. And, well, many of our kids are visual learners. So as we go throughout this presentation, I'd love to have you post some original feedback here using the hashtag LiveClass20. Uh, and 
please please tag me in the post as well. Um, take a picture from your laptop or your mobile device and post it on Twitter. Um, do you have an idea that maybe is spurred off of one of my ideas? Did you like one of the ideas that I presented? Always love using that, um, and it's a great way to extend our conversation outside of this webinar. So really, really excited for you to do that. Okay, so. The first question I want to ask you before I really get into what exactly, um, how you can use the power of image is why are images so useful to learning? I mean, we use them all the time, um, but why are they so useful to learning? Well, when you think about it, 65% of our population, uh, they, they actually identify with being a visual learner. So if two-thirds of our kids in our classrooms are visual learners, then why aren't we using the power of image beyond just a picture on a PowerPoint slot? Why can't we enhance learning through, their, through that, that medium? 90% um, of information transmitted by our brain is visual. And you may say, well, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. Think about this. If I say the word elephants or you see the word elephant, what comes to mind? Do you think of a big, gigantic creature on the Serengeti of Africa? How about an ocean? What comes to your mind? Do you hear the waves crashing? Do you see sunsets and seashells and sand? Or how about classroom? <laughs> Maybe some of you are getting a, a little bit of a, a cramp in the pit of your stomach because you have to go back to school here shortly. Uh, and maybe others of you are thinking of desks, neatly stacked desks in rows. Or maybe some of you are thinking of just some of the innovative classroom environments that exist today. So we all have visuals in our brain and whenever we think of a word or whenever we, we even see a word. So what I thought about is if you're not familiar with the technology integration model called the SAMR model, um, the SAMR model is just different levels of technology integration where it starts at a base level called substitution. And really what that means is, is that you could use technology as a substitute for what you would be doing on paper anyways. And that's really low level technology integration. So for example, if we were giving a writing assignment and all you had students do is just type that writing assignment in a Word document, that's an example of substitution. But as you work your way up through technology integration, you get to the, the R stage in SAMR called the redefinition stage, and that's where technology significantly changes the task. So I thought about that, and I wanted to apply that to a model for enhancing images. So as you can see right here, we have um, locate, that's really low level um, use of pictures, capture, create, and then remake. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you step by step through this model that I created and define it and give you some tools, Google tools, that you can use to enhance your experience. Now just to give you a little bit of background, I'm a Google for Education certified trainer, so I do a lot of this in trainings across the country and across the globe, and so this is just something that I'm very passionate about. So let's talk about locating. So when we're talking about locating pictures, we're talking about responsibly finding and experiencing the power of somebody else's image. So where do you typically go to get pictures? When you think about it, many of you go to Google, right? You do a Google image search, and uh, what you tend to do is you tend to go in and, and just type in the, the actual name of an object and just copy and paste. But if we're trying to teach our students to be digital citizens and give credit where it's due, we may need to teach them some other tips when they're searching for images. It shouldn't be just as easy as typing in the name of an object and then just copying and pasting it. So I want to show you some search tools right here on the Google search bar that may help enhance your process. So for example, when you click on, when you do an image search and then you, your images come up and you click right here on where it says search tools in the top right hand corner, you can actually see there's a color section. So you can, with some objects, search by color. So for example, if you wanted an orange car, you could look for an orange car or a yellow car, but it gets even better because not only can you look by color, you can also look by type. 
So for example, if you're having your students develop a presentation for an elementary audience, maybe you want them to look for clip art. If they're making a presentation for a more professional or academic audience, maybe photos are a little bit more appropriate. So that is a helpful search tool, but then when you think about it, from a usage standpoint, how exactly can we get kids to get pictures that they can use? Because it may not necessarily affect them too much in the classroom right now if they take somebody else's picture and, and copy and paste it into a PowerPoint or a website, but it could later on. For example, if they have some type of event at school and that image is distributed to the community, you could have some problems with copyright violations. Or if they start their own business or they start their own website. See, we want to teach these kids tools that they can use to then use technology and use images in an appropriate and respectful manner. So this right here, this usage rights tab, will allow you to find pictures that are labeled for use out of Creative Commons or you could use them for non-commercial reuse or uh, with some type of modification. So really, it's important to get our kids to understand that it's very, very important to look at the usage rights. There are other websites out there as well that you may want to check out, which I've uh, put in here for you. Uh, this one right here, um, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm actually uh, drawing a blank. It's on the live binder here. Uh, but this is this is actually um, one of the uh, Pixabay. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, Pixabay is uh, one of the sites that I use quite often. And what I like about that is that you can type in the image, and you can go through and you can download this image. But if you have Chromebooks, I like that you can save it to Google Drive because you can't save it on a desktop on a Chromebook, right? So that's a really great source. But did you look at the bottom bottom of my picture here? there's a citation. So this is a great way to have people cite their sources. Now there's a little bit of confusion, uh, I think, in education on how exactly we should cite pictures. And to be quite honest, I'm confused at times too. Um, but what I tend to have when I was in the classroom, have my students do, is take that citation and actually paste it in the notes section of their PowerPoint slide or at the bottom of their web page that they're using it in. Uh, so that can be a really helpful tip. Some people do it at the end of a presentation. They just make a, uh, make a slide with, this, this is where all my pictures came from. But really important to, to possibly do that. So um, this is actually a little bit more about Pixabay. Uh, it allows you to look at images through Creative Commons, uh, which is really, really helpful because in Creative Commons, you can reuse pictures. Sometimes you need to modify them a little bit. And then other times you can just reuse the picture. A lot of times it will tell you that. Now from a modification standpoint, what does that actually mean? Well, what it could mean is that you could take the picture and you could add different dimensions to it. You could crop it. You could you know, change the lighting with editing tools. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Okay, so this is called Flickr CC, and this is another way, once again, to uh, enjoy somebody else's images. Flickr CC, the CC stands for Creative Commons, is something that is constantly being added to each day, and you can find images. I also like that, once again, it cites it, uh, as you can see right there in the attribution section uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, in the green letters, that is the citation. So it's really helpful to do that. Uh, I think that that's really helpful. Now, before I move on to the next slide, I'm just going to go jump back and want to tell you one other thing about Pixabay. What I like about Pixabay is that not only is it just pictures, but you can get video clips as well. So I was putting together a video advertisement for one of my friends. He, he had a, an event that he was doing, and I was able to take video clips of different, different parts of a library because it was related to his topic. And fuse them together and create an iMovie. And it was completely uh, fine and legal because they could be used, reused. So that's something to keep in mind as well. It's not just pictures. So the, the question here is, is that how can an image, just a single image, how can that actually inspire learning? I mean, that's a really, really tough question to think about. And I, I just, I really 
wrestle with this sometimes is how can I inspire learning through pictures? So one of the things that I, I was doing some research on this and I found from Dr. Lionel Burmark this. He says, unless our words, our concepts and ideas are hooked to an image, they're going to go in one ear, sail through the brain and out the other ear. So what's to prevent your students from just looking at you, not thinking much, and then they forget the lecture. I mean, they, they totally forget it because there's no image to actually solidify the learning because words are processed by our short-term memory. But images go directly into our long-term memory and they're, they're almost tattooed on our brain with an image. So if you want to tattoo learning on your students' brains, use images because it really makes learning occur and happen and it makes it stick. So uh, think about it. I mean, how many times were you in science class growing up and your science professor asked you to look at a diagram in the book? Well, that diagram in the book might not necessarily make sense to you. But in today's classrooms, we have the ability to have students look at interactive uh, interactive displays, interactive web presentations, YouTube videos. There's all sorts of different ways that we can make it stick. And really, that's, that's what we need to, to do. So let's think about this. We're teaching, let's say we're teaching the book extremely loud and incredibly close in a high school English classroom. How could we give our kids the background knowledge that they need in order to understand the book? Well, one way that you could use it is Google Maps. I don't know if you ever used the Street View feature of Google Maps, but let's say that we wanted, wanted to go right here to New York where the Twin Towers were. Now, many of our high school students are students who maybe were too little to remember 9-11. Uh, maybe they don't understand the significance of this book. So we want to give them a visual to make some of the imagery in the book stick. So when you use the a street view of Google Maps, there's a section in the top left-hand corner of certain places called historical imagery. What you can do is you can see that particular part of the map at different points in time. So for example, in this image right here, we can go back to 2007 to see what that area of New York looked like. And then that exact same spot in 2014 looks like what you have on your screen. So this is a great way to show the changes that occurred over a significant period of time. Perhaps we're trying to discuss a book. Perhaps we're trying to show something in social studies. Perhaps we're talking about how urbanization is really changing many of our communities. So this is a really great way of showing that. But also, down here, I don't know if you see on the very, very bottom, there are different pictures that you see right there. That is a feature called Google's Photosphere. It's a 360 degree view of a particular area that anybody can shoot. So you can grab this app right here called the Google Maps Photosphere app and it's available regardless of the device you have. It'll take you through a wizard to shoot picture of a specific area and then you can upload it to Google Maps so that if anybody wants to see say the Great Wall of China, Rockefeller Center, um, the Washington DC, some of the monuments down there and they can see your particular video. So, or not video, but image. And it's a, a 360 degree view of that particular area. So really, really cool um, feature. Now Google has other features as well, other things that you can go on um, that are coming out. Uh, there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of expeditions that you can go on. You can go on tours of art museums, which is perfect for fusing together history and language arts, uh, and even mathematics as well. So very, very interesting tools that Google has to offer. What I also like is that having our students search for images is so powerful. So there's a bonus tool I want to offer you. It's called the Google Image Quiz. So see this image on your screen? That is a particular image. And then what you have to do is guess the query of the image above. And if you're not sure, you can have some hints. You can have certain letters revealed. And if you finally give up, they can share with you the answer. But it's a neat game that kids can play 
and it allows them to get better at searching because uh, I don't know if you've seen our kids search for information, especially our high school students. They type in the whole whole sentence or whole paragraph, and they're not used to using keywords. And even with image searching, that's very important. All right, so we talked about actually using somebody else's image, but a step above that is capturing. How do you capture images and videos to share your message to the world? Now, right now, I'm working with a group of fourth grade students. We're in our second year of a one-to-one -one initiative at the Milton Hershey School. And our students, yes, they're given iPads, but I'm surprised that they don't necessarily know how to take a picture. So basic skills such as, you know, you don't want to take a picture at a window uh, with somebody standing in front of a window because that glare of that light is going to darken their face and darken some of their features. So using natural lighting, knowing how to zoom in, knowing how to zoom out, knowing um, not how to keep your camera still and not move it so it gets all blurry. You know, things like that are really important for our kids. But one of the, the reasons why taking images is so important is because, think about it, social media posts with visuals, do you pay more attention to that? Because 94% uh, of these social media posts with visuals actually receive more engagement and page visits than those without. I learned that with Twitter and with my blog um, several years ago. Um, one of the things with my blog is that I will post weekly blog posts or sometimes several times a week. And when I would post a really creative uh, title, I would get a little bit of, of feedback. But then when if I created a, a really cool title and I attached an image to it, it was amazing the different resources that, or the different uh, feedback I got. So it was actually much more popular from a personal standpoint. And it's the same with our students as well. Okay? So uh, think about this, though. If students are using images or they're taking their own images, they have the ability to recall information after three days, only 10% if they're lectured to, 65% if they're lectured to with visuals. Now we know that lecturing isn't a really good, good um, way of, of doing things. Because after about 12 to 15 minutes, our kids, they, even us, <laughs> if we're sitting in a faculty meeting like that, we just lose uh, our train of thought and we start zoning out. And so we need to make sure that when we're lecturing, Yes, that's a very important thing to do, but we break it down maybe into chunks, and we offer visuals to stimulate the brain as well. And one of the things that I'm showing you right now with the way that I designed my PowerPoint presentation is that I try to do mostly visuals, and I try not to put chunks of text uh, unless they're quotes or important facts, but I try not to put every single thing that I'm going to say. And that's one thing that our students don't really do a great job of. So uh, often when I would give PowerPoint presentations in my class, I would have them do what I called TED Talk style, where they had to do a, a PowerPoint presentation or a Prezi or a Google Slideshow presentation with only pictures, no text at all. So that's a great way of getting our students to talk rather than just read, because anybody can read, right? So, Basically, my point is, is that a story, telling the story, capturing an image makes things stick. So one of the things that we can use is we can use pictures as a tool for reflecting. So say, for instance, we're talking about financial literacy and we're talking about credit. And maybe we want our students to use their iPads or their mobile devices to take pictures of things within our classroom that might be bought on credit. It's a great way for them to take a concept and show their own perception to measure if they're learning it or not. So I have my, my kids right here. This is uh, my daughter, Savannah, who's 10, and my son, Trey, who's 7. And we went to uh, a, a uh, museum down in Lancaster. Uh, there's a museum called the North Museum. And so we went down there, and they had a dinosaur display and everything. And they wanted me to take their picture in front of this stuffed Tyrannosaurus Rex because they thought that that was the coolest thing and that was the thing that they remembered most about their experience. Well, how often do we have our kids do that with learning during the day? It's taking a picture of maybe the most significant moment, a significant slide, maybe have themselves acting um, a particular vocabulary word out. Or maybe what we do is we have them demonstrate a math concept by taking a picture or a short video. So how often do we do that to reflect? Uh, one excellent tool for not only um, backing up your photos, 
but actually creating some things is Google Photos. If you're not familiar with Google Photos, you want to check it out because it offers unlimited storage space, but not only just photos, but also videos. And what's crazy is if when you're going through this, you can even search by somebody's face because it uses facial recognition features. Uh, I was up in Boston uh, over the summer and my family and I took some pictures and I could even type in Boston and it would bring up pictures of me in Boston. So really, really scary, uh, but, but also a really neat tool. So um, that's one of the things that, that you can use is you can actually use Google Photos to not only store that sort of stuff, but like I said, you can create. So they have some features on here, such as making a collage. You can pick any two or three pictures that you want and then put them in a collage. You could create an album. I love the album feature because uh, the album feature will allow you to take pictures and throw them in an album and share them with parents. So that could be a helpful tool if you went on a field trip or maybe you wanted to share what you've been doing this week with parents, taking pictures, you can send it on social media, you can also share the link and it will allow them then to see what's going on in your classroom. So with that collage feature, it could be used as a storytelling feature, right? So um, a little bit about my background is uh, I was a football player in school and I always coached football and then when I came to the Milton Hershey School I decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop coaching football and just see where I can get involved and plugged in. So I started doing the books for the volleyball team. And then a couple years later, they asked me to actually help coach the, the girls' volleyball team. So here are some of my girls from the volleyball team who took my iPad on the bench and started taking pictures of themselves. So what I, what I did right here is I've actually put together a collage of, you know, their different pictures right here. But you could use it as a storytelling tool, like I just did, to share a story and very little, it, with very little effort. This could be a really great way of sharing events, how events happened uh, in a story, uh, how a particular concept uh, works. And that's all in Google Photos. So you could upload your own pictures to Google Photos or you could take existing pictures and put them in. But I like this tool as well because uh, ever, since, ever since last year I've been working primarily in our elementary school where I've pretty much been a secondary guy. You know, I've always been a high school or middle school guy. And so going down to the elementary school is a little different for me. And so when I started learning about our pre-K um, grades and our kindergarten grades, I realized they didn't know how to spell their names. So this is a really cool idea I got from uh, Tot Schooling where you can take a picture of your students and then right underneath just write their name and cut it into pieces, into strips, so that they can practice spelling their names. But this might not necessarily just fit in a preschool or kindergarten classroom. Think about the foreign language classroom where you're learning new words and you're at an elementary level even though you might be a high school or middle school student. You could take objects, put those particular, the word for that particular object on there and then put together a puzzle. Uh, so that could be very helpful. Even history concepts or math concepts. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways that you could use this idea. And uh, if you don't have the best handwriting in the world, you could use Google Drawings to import your picture and write text underneath. So I'm going to show you a little bit about Google Drawings here in just a second. So the problem with word walls, think about word walls though. Uh, we want to enhance literacy in our classrooms. And so many schools, including mine, decide to put word walls around the room. Now, one of the limitations of word walls is that it's designed for one learner in mind. It's designed for the student who can actually read and understand the text. Okay? But what about the students who are visual? Because we have two-thirds of our students, 65%, who are visual. They are automatically at a disadvantage because they don't see an image with a particular new vocabulary word. So what I've done in the past is I have the word, but I also have a visual. So this word right here, Brumagem, is means inexpensive, cheap, okay? That's, that's what the word means. Now it may be easier for our students who are visually, uh, visually learning to understand this word better than they would if they just saw the word. 
and that's it. Uh, I've seen other uh, examples where you can use a, an app like Erasma and you can use virtual reality, augmented reality, to then scan that particular uh, word tag and have a video pop up of your students explaining it. Or maybe you have a QR code attached to your word wall here and have kids scan it and have a YouTube video or uh, an audio recording or a picture from Google Images uh, that you can use to explain that term. So really, really cool way of uh, making word walls stick. Now, I also love this. This is, um, this is Christine, and she's a teacher at our elementary school. Uh, she was a second grade teacher last year, and now she's a fourth grade teacher this year. But one of the things about the Milton Hershey School that I don't know if you realize is that it's the largest private residential school in the country. We have about 2,300 students at our school. Um, actually, we're getting to that number. And we take kids as early as age four, and um, they graduate at 18 years old. So many of these students, actually all of these students come from poverty. So they come from poverty. Um, their average family income is something like $16,000 a year. And so they're, they're 80 percent of them come from Pennsylvania, but the other 20 come from all over the country. So they're away from their families. And so their families are connecting with their teachers and their students via social media and different different tools. So Christine right here thought, let's use a Facebook page. But she also said, I'm going to use my iPad and I'm going to videotape my class, but using the time lapse video feature of her her social of her um, iPad and her camera to then create an hour worth of instruction into 10 seconds, right? And then she posts it on to social media. So this is a really cool way of sharing what's going on in class and allowing parents to be connected and see their kids in action rather than not knowing what's going on in the classroom. So a really neat tool. Google offers some great tools as well through social media. I mean, you have Google Plus, you have Google Hangouts. Why not have an hour where parents can come in in a Google Hangout and learn more about what you're talking about in class uh, and see their kids in action. So really, really neat way uh, of doing things. So another way to actually use your, your pictures and the capture pictures, this is from Ken Shelton. Now Ken Shelton is a Google god. I mean, he is just amazing. And he was at a Google summit that I was at um, a couple years ago, and he talked about how you could use an iPad or another type of tablet, open up the Google Drive icon or the application, sorry, create a folder, share the folder with all of your students, okay? What students then do is they take this device, they take their iPhone, their iPad, or their tablet, they open up the folder, and on the iPad, there's a way that you can take pictures, so when you want to add content, you choose take photos, that you can start snapping pictures, and you can start snapping video, and it automatically populates your shared folder. So you could have 30 students in your classroom taking 30 different pictures, and all of that content is going to be put in that particular folder. What I like about this is that if you have your students do this one day, say for instance you're beginning a chapter and you're talking about, uh, I keep going back to financial literacy because I, I did a lot of that in my previous school, having them take pictures of different things demonstrating, say, checking and savings accounts or credit or wh whatever. Now you have a database of pictures and photos. So now when students are asked to create something, they can go to that folder and they can grab images that aren't necessarily copyright protected. They're in your own Creative Commons use to create videos, posters, websites, anything that you need. And now there's less time searching for stuff. The content's already there. So that's a really, really, really cool way of uh, using this. And, um, and really, really neat. And Missy, I see that you had a question about having a tutorial and doing this. I think I'm going to have to create one. So, so uh, stay tuned uh, to my blog. Uh, I will work on getting that there for you because it's a really, really cool way of doing things. All right, so let's talk about the next level. So now we're getting into the creation part. So how do you actually combine the power of media and higher level thinking? Well, let's show you how. Because we talked about Google Photos earlier and we talked about collages, but there's an animation feature as well. So what the animation feature allows you to do whoops, is it'll take 
if you have 10 images, you have five images, it'll take it create an animated GIF for you so that every few seconds it flicks to a new image. So maybe you want to share what you learned today in class with five slides and an animation. You could do that. And so that is a really, really cool way of, of sharing some ideas and being very creative. Now, if you've never used this, this is Google Drawings. And how you could access it is if you go to Google Drive, you click on the New button where you would create a Google Doc or a sheet or even a folder, and go down to Even More, or, or More, I'm sorry. You're going to see an icon that pops up that looks just like this. This is Google Drawings. And what Google Drawings lets you do is take this canvas right here and add pictures, at, draw your own shapes, annotate things. I mean, there's all sorts of different things you can do with Google Drawings. And in fact, I'm going to be giving a webinar uh, on Google Drawings and Google Photos uh, through Simple K12 uh, in a couple weeks. So uh, I'm learning so, so much right now uh, on that. But one of the things that I do is I actually would have kids, for example, if they're in the math classroom, and we're talking about geometry, and we're talking about circles, taking pictures of different circles, and then we can collaborate as a class on this Google photo right here to create this. So this is a really cool idea. Unfortunately, I didn't create this. Uh, this is from the, uh, the Crafty Crow. But they, they used, um, I believe they used Collage Maker, but you could use Google Drawings to do that. So really, really cool idea right there that you can use. But David Garcia had an awesome idea about using, once again, this is a Google Drawing, as an interactive worksheet. So what I like how he did is he put a protractor in here. He got a picture of a protractor. And literally, when students access this worksheet, it forces them to make a copy. Once they have a copy, they can drag that protractor to the angles in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, measure the angle, and where the question mark is, type in what the angle measurement was, then drag the protractor off to the right, and use the drawing tools to draw a 32-degree angle, or 160-degree angle. Really neat way of creating an interactive worksheet. In fact, uh, I've, I've actually had a couple other ideas um, spur off of this, which I'm really going to be excited to share here in a few weeks. So really, really cool ideas. So um, one of those ideas was this, creating a graphic organizer. So for example, if you want your students to be able to uh, sum up a, the main topic of something and several ideas, but not just limit them to just typing in text. Sure, it, right now it has text for idea one, idea two, things like that. But the thing that they can do with Google Drawings, which makes learning even more accessible, is they can put in photos for their ideas if they'd like. They could put in video clips or um, other links, hyperlinks, to talk more about that, that particular concept. So that is a really neat way of making a graphic organizer interactive and work for the students in the way that they learn best rather than just confining them to text. So nice way of doing that. Here's another idea. This is from Eric Kurtz. Love this. This is a project that he did with um, having a uh, state or country. And once again, this is another Google drawing where he put in different information uh, for that. So really, really awesome ideas. This is a, a great idea from the kindergarten standpoint. It's actually allowing the kids to create a, a season sorter. Okay, So what they do is they drag the object to the particular section right here uh, where it would fall. So if they're looking at okay, what objects are for fall, what objects are for spring, what objects for summer, they can do that with this interactive worksheet. And once again, it's just a Google Drawing. That's all it is. But Google Drawings can also allow you to demonstrate how to do things. So for example, right here, now this is Sketch on the iPad. I'm just going to show you some examples. But you can do the same exact thing with Google Drawings. We take a picture, and then you annotate it. So you can demonstrate how you're doing things, demonstrate what different parts of the globe look like, or I'm sorry, geography look like, demonstrate angles with a coat hanger, OK, right here, or even problem solve. So you're having your kids figure out and do some problem solving where they have to come up with directions on how to get from point A to point B. They create a visual, but at the same time, they have to actually um, write those instructions. That's something that our kids really struggle with is step-by-step -step instructions explaining how to do things. So combining a visual with text could really enhance the process. So 
very, very cool way of doing things. And I love using, creating Google Drawings as a summarization tool. So for example, if you give your students the opportunity to demonstrate the water cycle right here, they could use the annotation tools on whether it's uh, Google Drawings, this is once again Sketch, they could do that to demonstrate the concept because it's much, much more powerful having them do it than necessarily just you. All right, so uh, Peggy had mentioned earlier about the power of screencasting, and if you are not screencasting, uh, what are you doing? No, I'm, I'm just kidding, but, but really screencasting is powerful because it records whatever's on your screen, sort of like what we have right here with a webcast, but it takes it to a whole different level because it will allow you to create your own videos. So some Google extensions that you could potentially do is Nimbus Screenshot or Screencastify. If you're not necessarily a Google user, that's fine. There's ad, iPad applications like Explain Everything that you could use. Or on your computer, if you're more of a PC or Mac person, you could use um, Screencast-O-Matic uh, to once again create free videos, these are all free, that you could use to then show your students a couple different things. So one uh, is homework. Think about homework and how students don't do it. And many of it is because they don't get any help at home because their parents don't understand it. So I had uh, a woman that I met, Kim Meldrum, she's out of Canada, who creates just a one to two minute screencast explaining the homework assignment, giving a sample problem, and then she uploads it to her own private YouTube channel where students and parents can access. Then she takes videos from other people that have maybe talked about different math concepts that do it in a better way and put it in there as a scaffold and support for her students. So really neat way of doing that. But then you have my friend Denny Moore right here. Denny Moore is a biology teacher at the Milton Hershey School. He's a legend. And what he found is that he would give his kids these uh, Punnett squares in, when they were talking about genetics. But the kids could fill out the worksheet, but they couldn't explain why they filled out the worksheet. You know? and so he wanted to make learning a little, uh, to, to really deepen the learning process. So what he did was he had his kids take a picture of this particular worksheet and then use screencasting software to fill out the problem and explain their reasoning behind what they put, why they put that answer there. So Denny would often go through and he would, he would look at the end of the video to see if they got it right and then if he had some questions or needed some clarifications, he could then listen to their reasoning and it only took the students a few minutes to do this. So really, really neat way of using that. All right, so we get to the highest level of uh, using images, and that is remaking. And I'm going to give you two examples of remaking, meaning transforming the limits of media and higher level thinking and just redesigning a process that could not be done without technology. So let's show you two examples. So one is literally making your pictures speak a thousand words. So you remember the Ken Shelton example earlier? Perhaps you need a Google folder where they, you, you create, you share with your students. You have your students take pictures throughout your classroom in video clips of a particular concept in action or demonstrating that concept. Well, then you collect them all and you turn them into a collage with an application called Lupe Collage, which is a, a Google Chrome extension. What you can then do with Lupe Collage is you could put this, this set of pictures into a shape or you could turn it into the shape of a word. So if you're talking about iPads, you could literally make this say iPad, okay? Then take your picture and use Screencastify, the Chrome extension Screencastify, to explain why you did what you did, what it means to you, and reflect on your learning, okay? Once you do that, then you could take that particular object and publish it. So now if you publish it on YouTube, or you could publish it via Google Drive, you could take all of your students' content and throw it into a shared Google Drive folder. So now when they're reviewing for a test, they need information for doing a project, or they want, need to hear it in a different way, they can then access that anytime they want because it's in a Google photo or folder. All right, the last one that I'm going to share with you, and then I'm going to start wrapping up here because we're getting short on time, is sharing the journey. Now, I have a question for you. What does a book, a motorcycle, and this little flat Stanley guy named Kevin have in common? 
Well, it's my friend John, who's an extreme motorcyclist, who literally motorcycles to Mississippi for good barbecue. I'm not kidding. This guy actually would, would leave his house on Friday evening and get down to Mississippi so that he could eat barbecue on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, no, no lie. So what John does is he actually um, does these extreme motorcycle rides from one part of the country to the next, so east coast to west coast, and 50 hours or less. Okay, it's insane. And then what he does is he rests a little bit and turns around and then goes from San Diego to Florida. So it's a race against time. What he does, and I, I, um, I, I think this is awesome, is he adopted a second grade student home at our school. Now, to, to really tell you what a student home is, is that when our kids come to our school, they live in homes with other kids their age. Um, maybe there's about six to eight of them in a household at the elementary level. A group of house parents, so a married couple, raises them while they're at school. Well, many of these kids, because they come from poverty, have never been outside the confines of their community. Hershey is foreign to them because they see cows and they see, they see Hershey Park, but they've never been anywhere else. And so what he did was he adopted the student home and he used this application called Spotwalla. Okay? Spotwalla allows you to see this map right here and he checks in. So he checks in when he got gas, when he slept, when he ate. And so the kids could track him in real time as he's going on this journey, right? So then what John did was he took pictures along his journey and he created an interactive book. Now he used Book Creator on the iPad to do this where you could add links, you could add audio and video clips, and this interactive book he then published for these students and was a lot, took them on the journey with him. So they were with him on the journey, they were with him after the journey, he explained things. I mean, it was really cool what he did. He inspired these kids through this app, Spotwalla, and also Book Creator to create something that inspired them to see the world, to want to travel, to want to better themselves, to want to, to go and see a part of the country that they've never seen before. And so how could you do this with Google? Well, you could do it very easily. You could have a group of your students collaborate on a book through Google Slides. You could have your students create a Google Slides show, show presentation, add links, add interactive components, and just save it as a PDF so that anybody could view it, share it as a Google Slideshow presentation, because Google Slides aren't just for PowerPoint presentations. You can also make your own book. So really neat way of sharing that. So the evolution of pictures. Uh, I took you through my process right here. Is very low level things are you know, locating. Um, capturing takes a little bit more skill. Creating takes a little bit more skill than that. But remaking transforms the process. Uh, I wanted to share this with you. If you've never seen this right here, this clip, um, we'll be sharing the link with you. But it's called John Butterall's Virtual Photo Walk. To give it a, a brief synopsis, John right here is a photographer. And one day he had the idea that he wanted to take people along with him to his journeys in the wilderness. And so he attached his phone to his camera and he sent a Google Hangout invitation to anybody who wanted to come. And so he would take pictures and people would see things in real life at real time as he was taking these pictures. He would upload the pictures to Google and then share them with his community and the rest of the world. Well, one woman joins this. Uh, her name is Corey. Corey is confined to her couch because she has MS. And the only thing that she gets to see on a daily basis is just her backyard. And it's full of weeds. It's not very pleasant. And it's very depressing. John was able to take Corey on a trip that would have never been possible without technology, without the power of, of picture, but also the power of the human spirit. See, there's something about the human spirit that we need images, we need stories, and we need that emotional component, and it stirs us like nothing else. And so John Butterall's virtual photo walk is just a really great example of what I like to try to accomplish every day in, in classrooms that I visit is that we need to use the power of picture to touch the human heart. And so I just want to thank you very much for uh, allowing me to make this presentation today. Uh, as Peggy has shared multiple times my blog, please feel free to, to check out my blog. 
um, reach out to me. You know, my email address is mattbergman14 at gmail.com. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter. I see many of you are tweeting some great ideas. Can't wait to, to check that out a little bit later. Uh, so I'm, I'm really thankful. And uh, I'm going to actually turn it back over uh, to you guys. Thanks so much, Matt. I did capture a few questions as we went along. So let me get to them. You might have already answered this. Where do you typically go to find images for media projects? Yes. So really, uh, a great site that you could use is Pixabay. They have mm -hmm. many different video clips that you could use to, uh, to, that are free and open to anybody. Great. You mentioned the percentage of information that's recalled by viewing a, a, a picture. Does that change if you create that image yourself? That is a, oops, that is a really good question. Um, I, although there's no scientific evidence that I've, I've uh, looked up or been aware of, there is something about creating content mm -hmm that really uh, does solidify learning. I mean, I think about uh, that one uh, graphic that uh, we, we've always seen in our undergrad classes about kids will, kids will remember 90% of what they teach others and mm -hmm. what they say. I would think that that would really increase if we're actually doing something. Mm -hmm. Sure. OK. A couple other questions came in as you were answering that one. So let me try and. Grab hold of them. Um, let me ask one as I'm doing that. Uh, is Pixabay better than Photos for Class, or are they similar? I would say that they're similar. I mean, I like some of the features of Pixabay because of the the video content and also the um, the, the different qualities of pictures. But they, I they would say they're about the same. Okay. In Google Drawings, when you make interactive worksheets, do you share them as view only? Yes, um, there, there's a couple different things you can do. One is you can make it view only. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have Google Classroom, uh, what you could do is you could share that Google drawing and then make a copy for everybody so it does it automatically. Or I just found this out the other day uh, after doing some research, and I have it on my blog on how to do this, is that at the, when you look at your image uh, on Google Drawings, at the very end of your image, it's going to have a forward slash and it's going to say, edit. Okay? If you delete the word edit and you type in the word copy, then copy that URL and send it to whoever you want to access your Google Photos or uh, Google Drawings, sorry. Mm -hmm. When they open that link, it will automatically force them to have to make a copy right away. They, they won't have to go up to file mm -hmm. and make a copy. It will automatically mm -hmm. do that for them. Just change the word edit in the URL to copy. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Um, if you if you check out my blog, um, mm -hmm. actually the last post I did, I did it exactly on that. So please check that out. That's great. A lot of participants today shared other resources in the chat. Um, those were most of the questions, if not all of them. Some of them were answered as we went along. So I think we did get to all the questions, unless somebody else has anything else to ask. Yeah, and if, if uh, you know, after the presentation uh, you have more questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter uh, and also my email address. I always love doing that. So uh, that's always an option too. Thanks so much, Matt. Yes, you will be able to see the presentation later, Marion. The, the recording will be posted later. I'm now going to turn over the mic to Peggy, who will talk about upcoming shows. 
Thank you so much, Matt. I think we're all so inspired. We can't wait to get started on trying out some of these great tips you shared with us. And we have some other great shows coming up, so I hope you'll all plan to come back and join us every Saturday, same time. Next Saturday, we have two amazing people. Rebecca Hare and Robert Dillon are going to be sharing all kinds of ideas and ways to create good learning space design. And the ideas are all part of their new book called The Space. So come and hear from them. We won't have a show on September 3rd because it's Labor Day weekend. But on September 10th, Heidi Samuelson is going to do a great presentation on classroom resources for enhancing technology. I've seen that presentation, and it's excellent. And on September 17th, Laura Kronicki has a great presentation on global literacy and geography resources. Another excellent way to take advantage of a lot of those Google tools. Um, on September 24th, we're having a super show with Mike Murata, who's going to talk about assistive technology for struggling readers. And he has some great suggestions and tools for us. And then October 1st, Karen. And Lerman and Kristen Wydeen are going to be sharing some terrific ideas for innovating with the iPad. So lots of super things coming up. We hope you'll join us. And we'll always be recording these. So if you can't make it to the live shows, which we'd love to have you here, please check out the recordings later. Thanks. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD in one place, including host your own webinar, meaning you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate classroom. And as long as your session is public, it's a free session. You can nominate a featured teacher. Matt was our featured teacher for August by filling out the form here at this link. That form is also in the Live Binder, as well as the classroom 2.0 Live Survey. You can also access the link for the survey in the blog or in the chat log, log uh, or the Live Binder or the uh, Classroom 2.0 Live site. And this is what the survey looks like. And your name prints out here, thanks to Patty Russing. She's the one that sends it out. As long as when you complete the survey, you request a professional development certificate. This is what it looks like. The professional development certificate looks like. I got ahead of myself. I apologize. Special thanks again to Matt Bergman, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much.